Welcome back to part three of the foundation series, the place for those who are serious about building a business properly. In this episode, we will be discussing the various ways that you can create the legal format for your business to help you decide which one is best for you. If you've not watched part one of the foundation series, then I highly recommend you go back and watch it first. Each video builds upon the previous one and I want to help you get the most out of this information. It's taken me decades to learn and mentor others. You will find the link to part one of this series in the information below. Let's get started. Roger Pearson here, where we talk all about the basics of building a business. Today's subject is intended to give you the basic knowledge you need to legally run your business in the format that is most advantageous for your current and future situations. There's a lot of information here, so you may want to save this video to watch again or another way to learn all of this that I'll tell you about later. Before we get started, make sure that you jot down any questions you may have and remember to post them in the comments section. New entrepreneurs are often so excited to get started with their new business that they do not research how's the best way to set up their business to control costs. And the biggest cost that can be controlled by the proper legal format is the amount of money that becomes taxable income under federal, state, province, local, and in some cases, foreign laws. Therefore, it is essential that the business owner understand the different tax treatments before deciding on the legal format of their business. While this video series will concentrate on the legal formats and tax treatments that are used in the United States of America, the principles we will discuss can be transferred to whichever region of the globe that you reside in that allows a free market system and imposes taxes. I will briefly be discussing the following legal structures. Sole proprietorships, C corporations, S corporations, partnerships, and limited liability companies. There is no single form of business that is the right one for all situations, although certain types of businesses gravitate towards certain formats. There are also different formats available in different states, as well as federal classifications that have to be considered. The two basic factors that you're trying to achieve are the degree you want to limit your personal liability from your business activities and the impact of taxes on your profit margin. Other factors to be considered include the cost of forming and operating the business, the flexibility you may need, the number of owners, and the ability to select different tax treatments at the state and federal levels. A sole proprietorship is the simplest form of business there is. You simply go out and start working. You're not required to enter into any agreements or file any documents with the government to create a sole proprietorship. However, you may in some jurisdictions be required to register your business name. For instance, if you conduct your business under an assumed name such as Joe's Painting Company. This is the format that most small businesses operate under as it's the most basic and informal form of conducting a business. It can have as many employees as necessary, but it can only have one owner. When it comes to accounting, although the business needs its own set of bookkeeping, all financial assets and liabilities are considered to belong to the individual owning the business. For instance, the sole proprietorship may borrow money to finance the business, but the business owner will be totally responsible for its repayment. And not only should you keep separate sets of books for business and personal, but it is also a good idea to set up separate bank accounts for the business. The owner of a sole proprietorship is completely liable for anything their business does. In some countries, this can come in the form of a lawsuit against the business which could strip you of everything you own. Now there's a couple of things you can do to help protect yourself. The first is to purchase an umbrella liability insurance policy. A million dollar policy is usually sold on an annual basis and they are reasonably priced, or in most cases, you can just form a single member limited liability company, also known as an LLC, which gives you some protection for your personal assets. When it comes to taxes, all profit and losses of the business are entered on Schedule C and the 
Bottom line is transferred to page one of your personal income tax return. If the business had a profit, the owner will have to pay federal and our state income taxes at the same rate as the owner's personal tax rate. If the business had a loss, that's subtracted from any other income the owner and spouse, if filing jointly, earned that year. Essentially, your business income from a tax standpoint is treated the same as your W-2 income. You should also know that if the business buys equipment, which has a projected life of more than one year, such as a compressor, a, a trailer, or a vehicle, they must be reported separately as depreciable items. You're then allowed to deduct the entire amount of the purchase or deduct a little bit of the purchase price over several years. This is advantageous if you figure your profit's going to be more in future years and thus could use the deductions more in future years than in the current year. This is one of the ways that you can use the tax code to control how much tax you pay which you should learn or make sure the tax preparer you use discusses all of the options with you. When you turn a profit, you also become responsible for self-employment taxes, which are also referred to as payroll taxes or social security taxes, if your net profit was $400 or more. These are currently 15.3% of the net profit that the sole proprietorship reported on the Schedule C, and they include two components, a 12.4% tax for Social Security, which has a dollar cap that is adjusted each year. For instance, for 2022, only the first 147,000 is assessed this tax, and a 2.9% tax for Medicare, which is always paid on the entire net profit. If you have employees, a sole proprietorship is subject to federal unemployment tax, which is 6.2% of the first $7,000 of each employee's salary. And there may also be a state unemployment tax which can then be taken as a credit on the federal unemployment tax. Self-employment earnings and taxes are reported on Schedule SE Form 1040 Self-Employment Tax, which then flows through to page two of the individual personal's 1040. The sole proprietor can then deduct one half the self-employment tax as a deduction against income on page one of Form 1040. A sole proprietorship has the option of using the owner's social security number or an employee identification number, commonly referred to as an EIN. I always recommend that you obtain an EIN, which you can get free at the irs.gov website, so that you don't have to give out your personal social security number to vendors and so forth. That said, there are three instances that you must use your EIN. If you have employees, if you file returns for excise taxes, or if you have a qualified retirement plan. If you have people work for you, they can be treated one of two ways. As an employee, and this means that you control the way that they work. You tell them where to work, how to work, and when to work, just as if you were working for somebody else. You must have the employee fill out the form W-4 so you know how much an income and payroll taxes to withhold, and the Form I-9 to prove that they are in this country legally. You must also pay the employer's share of Social Security, Medicare, state and federal unemployment taxes and workers' compensation premiums. These are normally remitted monthly or quarterly depending on the size of your business along with the appropriate forms. Or you can hire subcontractors. They own their own businesses and they're responsible for all of their own taxes and tax reporting requirements. You may hire them to do a job, but you cannot tell them how or when to work like you do your employees. You are hiring their business. If the tax authorities audit your return and determine that you have expensed your labor as a subcontractor, but treated them like employees, they will reclassify them and hit you with the bill for all the back taxes you should have paid. That can hurt. You should have them fill out a form W-9, which gives you their social security or EIN numbers, and verifies that you are not responsible for withholding taxes for them. Also, any subcontractor you pay more than $600 a year to has to be given a Form 1099-NEC stating that amount that you paid them and listing their identification number. A copy of this is sent to the IRS showing that they are responsible for their own taxes and thus helping protect your business from reclassification. This must be done by January 31st of the following year. While running even a sole proprietorship is not exactly as easy as buying a paintbrush and 
finding a house to paint, do not let the paperwork requirements overwhelm you. I would advise talking to a professional tax advisor that specializes in business returns. And there are also many firms that will take care of your payroll needs, such as issuing payroll checks, deducting the appropriate amounts, filing all the government paperwork, and remitting the taxes owed. Shop around, compare prices, and get referrals. What so many new business people do not consider is that they need to be putting away at least 30 to 40 percent of their net profits just to cover tax liabilities and many countries are even more and having to come up with the money to pay a large tax bill at the end of the year has doomed many businesses to failure so remember that having a clear understanding of the relationship between you your business and your government rules and obligations will allow you to make a better decision as your business grows at the other end of the business spectrum are corporations. Corporations are entities created by law, such as IBM, Microsoft, Google. Corporations are created at the individual state level and are subject to the laws of that state. Now, many people prefer to incorporate in states like Delaware or Nevada because those states are a little more liberal in their tax treatments. Well, the other states make policy to combat this sort of activity, for instance, Florida treats corporations doing business in their state, but incorporated in another state as a foreign corporation and charges them higher fees to do business in the state to compensate for the lost tax revenue. Every government entity wants their piece of the pie, so be sure to do your research. You will find that most large businesses are created as C corporations. They get this name because they are subject to subchapter C of the Internal Revenue Code. The IRS views a C corporation as a completely separate legal entity that files its taxes separate from the shareholders who own it. With all other business formats, the net profit or loss passed down to the owner's personal tax return, and any taxes on profits left in the C corporation at the end of the fiscal year are paid by the corporation. The problem for small businesses using the C corporation status is the problem of double taxation at the corporation and shareholder levels. Profits are taxed to the corporation when the income is earned and again to the shareholder when the income is received as dividends. The advantage for small businesses is if you want to go public in the future or want to attract investors to grow the business. It gives you greater latitude for benefits such as retirement plans. Finally, it completely shields your personal assets from lawsuits. The initial shareholders normally contribute cash or property to the corporation in exchange for shares in the corporation. One mistake a lot of small business people make when they're setting up their corporation is to assign tax-free shares in exchange for services to the corporation. You can't do this. If a stockholder receives stock in exchange for services provided to the corporation, that stockholder must claim the stock as income on their personal tax return based on the fair market value of the stock they received. If you plan to try to attract initial investors, then you should consider issuing Section 1244 stock when you form the corporation. You see, normally if you invest in a business that goes bust and you lose your investment, you can only deduct $3,000 a year from your taxes until you recapture your loss. However, if a new corporation issues 1244 stock when they're starting, if the business should fail, the investor can deduct up to $50,000 if filing single or $100,000 if filing jointly, and then the rest of the loss at the standard $3,000 a year. As you can imagine, this makes the investment much more attractive to investors to turn over their money to you. Of course, not everyone qualifies for Section 1244 stock. The stock must be issued when the corporation was a small business corporation, which is defined as money and other property received for stock, contributions to capital and paid in surplus is not more than a million dollars. Contributed property is based on the adjusted basis reduced by any liability it was subject to at the time of contribution. And the stock can only be issued to the original investors to the corporation. If the stock is sold, given as a gift, or transferred to a trust or estate, it loses its Section 1244 status. 
and the corporation cannot derive more than 50% of its gross receipts from investments such as royalties, rents, dividends, interest, uh, annuities, or stock sales. These three qualifications must be in place during the previous five years of when the loss is taken, but since most new businesses will fail within the first five years, that is really a reasonable restriction. As with sole proprietors, employees must fill out the W-4 and I-9 forms or the W-9 forms for subcontractors. Small corporations normally employ shareholder owners, which are typically the founders. One way to prevent double taxation is for the owners to pay themselves a salary, which if reasonable can be used as a deductible expense to the corporation. Now reasonable expense is defined as the amount that you would ordinarily be paid for similar services for similar corporations under similar circumstances. And this is because the IRS can disallow the deduction if the compensation is unreasonable as they view that as a tax avoidance scheme. At the same time, the recipient of the unreasonable income will still have to pay taxes on the full amount received even if the corporation can't deduct it. Since most small businesses are not looking for investors or plan to sell on the stock market, but still want the protections and tax flexibility of a corporation, they should choose to be classified as an S corporation. These are small business corporations meeting the requirements of subchapter S of the Internal Revenue Code. An S corporation is really a hybrid. A C corporation is created at the state level, and then the corporation files the S election form with the IRS, which changes how they're taxed. Essentially, the taxes on profit or loss are paid at the shareholder level instead of at the corporate level, which can produce significant tax savings. In fact, it's the only legal format where an active owner of the business can shield part of their income from payroll taxes. And more on that later. Large and public corporations usually can't choose the S corporation election because of the small business requirements, which are, these requirements are, it can't be a prohibited corporation, such as an insurance company, uh, possessions corporation, taxable mortgage pool, or a few others. The shareholders must either be individuals, certain types of trusts or estates, or qualifying tax-exempt entities. It can't have more than one class of stock, like common stock or preferred stock. can't have them both. There can be no more than 100 shareholders, and no shareholder can be a non-resident alien. Now, a corporation is eligible to be taxed as an S-corporation only if it qualifies as a small business corporation each fiscal year. So if you have a rapidly growing business, you must make sure that you continue to qualify for eligibility or it will fall back into a regular C corporation status with some unexpected tax consequences. Not all is lost if this should happen. You can ask the IRS for a waiver in time to fix the problem to bring your business back into compliance, but it is at their discretion to allow the waiver. As I mentioned, creating a corporation is done at the state level, electing to be taxed as an S corporation is done at the federal level by filing form 2553 with the IRS. The election should be signed by the same person authorized to sign the corporation's tax return and all shareholders on the date of the election must consent to it. For a new corporation, this should be done within the first 90 days after incorporation to be valid for the year of incorporation. For an existing C corporation, it must be filed by the end of the third month of the fiscal year of the corporation to be counted for that fiscal year. If filed after the third fiscal month, the S election will become valid the following year. While rarely used, other legal entities like sole proprietorships, partnerships, and LLCs can choose to be taxed as an S corporation. The process for this would be to file Form 8832, Entity Classification Election with the IRS, which is an election to be treated as a corporation, and then file Form 2553 to elect to be treated as an S corporation. I do not recommend this course of action unless there are sound reasons for it, and you should consult a tax advisor specializing in small businesses first. As I mentioned previously, an S-corporation is a flow-through entity. 
the income or loss flows down to be paid at the shareholders on their personal return. One of the things that you should know is that income deductions are passed down in like form. For instance, ordinary income or loss is added or subtracted from the ordinary income on the shareholder's tax return. Dividend interest is passed down to the shareholder's Schedule D and combined with other investment income, which may be subject to the $3,000 a year loss limit. Charitable deductions are passed through to the shareholder's Schedule A and added to other charitable contributions. This is why it is important to consider the type of income your business will be receiving when deciding whether to file for the S election. For instance, if your company gives to charities, you can only deduct this if you itemize using Schedule A on your personal return, which very few people do under the current tax laws. By comparison, since a C corporation pays its own taxes, it can deduct charitable contributions. Each year, the S corporation must issue to each shareholder a Form 1120S, Schedule K-1, which details what to include on the shareholder's personal tax return. This must be done by the 15th of the third month of the fiscal year. For a calendar year, that would be March 15th. Six-month extensions can be filed if you can't do it by then, but some shareholders get a little bit upset when the extension delays them filing their own personal returns. In most S corporations, the work is done by the owners and maybe a few employees. Like C corporations, you must have the employees fill out a Form I-9 and a Form W-4 and withhold income from each employee's salary based on the exemptions claimed. Now here is a unique thing about S corporation taxation. The ordinary income that flows down to the shareholder from the S corporation on the K-1 is not subject to self-employment tax. That's a savings of 15.4% of the net profit allocated to each shareholder. Because of this, many owners do not pay themselves a salary in an attempt to avoid payroll taxes or from simple ignorance of the law. However, the IRS does not allow this. If your S corporation is making a decent profit and you don't pay yourself a salary with Social Security and Medicare taken out, the IRS considers that evasion of payroll taxes. If the corporation's tax return is audited, the IRS may reclassify some of the profits and hand the corporation and thus the shareholders a bill for the payroll taxes that should have been paid. Here's the thing. The IRS examines C corporations to see if the owner shareholders are paying themselves too much and examines S corporations to see if the owner employees are paying themselves too little. So the best course of action is to determine what you would pay on average an employee to do your job in the current job market and make that your salary. Another way to look at it is this. The IRS considers that between 40% and 60% of your net profits should be paid out in shareholder salaries. Now there's many ways to create a corporation and they're different in each state. It's generally done by the majority stockholders or someone hired to create the corporation for them. There's many firms that specialize in creating corporations for people. I've added a link below to one of them. Remember that S corporations require a two-step process, creating the corporation at the state level and filing the S election from the IRS. If you outsource this paperwork, make sure it's done correctly. Never assume. People make mistakes. A partnership is an unincorporated joint venture by two or more persons to carry on a business as co-owners for profit. It's one of the most popular formats and like S corporations are pass-through entities. The tax liability passes through to the individual partners. Some states have other forms of entity organizations such as multi-member limited liability companies, LLCs, or limited liability partnerships or limited liability limited partnerships. All of these forms are taxed as partnerships, or in the case of a single member LLC, it is regarded as a sole proprietorship with added limited liability. More on LLCs in a bit. Now there are no formal legal requirements to start a general partnership. Any two or more individuals who get involved in a business or financial undertaking automatically becomes a partnership for tax purposes. The minimum requirements to begin a partnership simply are, you have two or more owners, the activity conducts a business, 
and it operates with a profit motive. That's it. The Uniform Partnership Act defines a general partnership as an association of two or more persons to carry on as co-owners a business for profit. This can be orally or in writing. So even though not required, creating a partnership agreement is highly advisable. A proper partnership agreement governs the relationship between the partners. It states any special allocations of income, deductions, gains, losses to the partnership for tax purposes. It spells out what happens upon the death of a partner, the withdrawal of a partner, any restrictions on the sale of a partnership interest, and the dissolution of the partnership. I like to think of the partnership agreement like a prenuptial agreement. It spells out what happens if someone leaves the partnership or the partnership is dissolved. I've seen some real doozies of fights between partners because there was no written agreement when the business was started. Although there is no requirement to file documents to create a general partnership like a corporation has, a partnership is also treated as a separate legal entity. It can hold real and personal property, sue or be sued, or conduct business independently of its members. Each partner owns a partnership interest, but no partner owns a specific asset of the partnership. In most states, a general partnership does not have to file with the state, like corporations or limited partnerships do. Although a partnership is not a taxable entity, it determines how taxable items are passed through to the partners. It determines things such as character, amount, and type of income, gains or losses, deductions or credits. It decides accounting methods, depreciation methods, and amortization cost. The partnership has to file Form 1065 with the IRS each fiscal year and then issue to each partner Form 1065 Schedule K-1, reporting the partner's share of income, gain, loss, deductions, and credits that is entered on their personal return. Partnerships are simple to form, but one of the most complex to administer. This complexity comes from keeping track of the basis of each partner's share during the life of the partnership, as the IRS has a long list of rules that govern how this is done. This is another reason why a partnership agreement should be written and a proper accounting system maintained. Anytime a partner's share of the business changes by withdrawal, death, injections of additional capital, buyouts, or dissolution, the basis needs to be known to properly allocate the profits or losses. This is also true of shareholders and S-corporations. When a group of individuals or entities form a partnership, or an S corporation, they usually contribute money or property in exchange for their share of the business. The partner's or shareholder's basis is the same as the basis of the property contributed. There is a whole set of rules that determine the basis contributed, exchanged, or sold. A couple of examples include, if the property that a partner contributes has a liability attached to it, the basis is reduced by the amount of the liability and the partner is relieved of it. If the liability exceeds the basis of the partnership interest, the partner must recognize gain up to the date of the exchange, or if appreciated property is contributed, the partner is not required to recognize the gain on the transaction. Yay! Even as a tax professional, it's enough to make your eyes glaze over. The complexity was created because over the years, people have tried to avoid taxes by moving property in and out of partnerships, so the IRS has created a complex set of rules like these to close the loopholes. It's therefore vital that a complete record of any changes to the partnership that affect partnership percentages basis be documented and relayed to your tax advisor. Although S-corporations and partnerships are both pass-through entities, partnerships have the unique availability of special allocations to partners, and this is why most medical and legal firms are created using this legal format. Unlike corporations which have rigid structures, partnerships can be structured whatever way the partners want. Because of the flexibility inherent in subchapter K, partnership agreements can be written to reflect what Ever economic sharing agreement and risk sharing agreement the parties wish to execute. For example, 
Partner A who has skills go into business with Partner B who has capital. Partner B contributes $100,000 in cash. A and B agree to split the business profits 2080 until B recovers the entire investment. Thereafter, the profits are split 50-50. Special allocations permit partners to assume different levels of risk and to set the timing of income in accordance with their preferences. But such flexibility comes with strings attached. Partners are not able to allocate tax benefits among themselves in a manner that is different from their allocation of profit or loss. A partner who is economically enriched by an item of a partnership income or gain is required to shoulder the associated tax burden. And likewise, a partner who is economically hurt by an item of partnership loss will be allocated to the tax benefit of that loss. The tax allocations must ultimately conform to the economics of the partnership's transactions. And considering all of the basis and allocation rules, partnerships can become quite complex. But for certain situations, they can bring together people who have vastly different things to offer and give them a viable and fair format to do business. There is one more consideration you should know about before you decide to use the general partnership format. Each general partner is subject to paying their own self-employment taxes just like a sole proprietor. That means you will have to pay the 15.3% payroll tax on your partnership income with your personal tax return. The partnership must issue each partner a Form 1065 Schedule K-1 reporting the partner's share of income, gain, loss, deductions, and credits to use with their personal return on the 15th day of the third month of the fiscal year just like S corporations unless an extension is filed. The difference between a general partnership and a limited partnership is simply as the name implies. It contains one or more partners who is not liable for partnership obligations. There has to be at least one general partner and at least one limited partner. The general partner is generally liable for all the partnership's obligations and debts. A limited partner is not responsible for the partnership's debts beyond their investment. To fully qualify as a limited partner, the partner must not participate in the control of the business. This type of partner is usually just an investor who expects a return on their investment. And the profits are considered investment income, so they're not subject to the self-employment tax. Since limited partnerships are governed by state statute, a partnership agreement should be agreed upon and then the partners need to file with the state in which the limited partnership is to be organized. Once filed, state limited partnership laws only come into play if the matter has to be decided and it is not spelled out in the limited partnership agreement. Courts generally defer to the limited partnership agreements first and the state law second. The drawback of being a limited partner is that while you will never lose more than your investment, if there's a loss, the passive income loss rule states that you can't take the loss against your other income on your personal tax return. You have to carry it over to the next year until there's enough profits in the partnership to subtract it from, or the partnership files a final return upon going out of business. It's a good thing to know before investing your money. Only about half the states offer the protection accorded under the LLLPs. They are basically limited liability partnerships that have extended limited liability protections for general partners against vicarious liability. In an LLLP, no general or limited partner is liable for the partnership's obligations, which were created solely by another partner's malfeasance. Certain states such as Arkansas and Texas use a different name for these entities such as registered limited liability partnerships. Lastly, Limited liability companies are becoming increasingly popular. Every state and the District of Columbia have some type of statutes governing the formation and operation of LLCs. They're normally used for businesses with small numbers of active participants, family closely held businesses, real estate investments, joint ventures, and investment partnerships. Essentially, any business that's not contemplating an IPO in the near future should consider using a LLC. An LLC has the characteristics of both a partnership and a corporation. Like a corporation, the members are usually not personally responsible for the debts of the LLC. And like a partnership, 
it has greater flexibility and doesn't have to do formalities such as shareholder meetings. The main advantage of an LLC is that its members are not re personally responsible for the debts of the business. Members have the same protections as shareholders of corporations or limited partners. But unlike limited partnerships, which require that at least one general partner be personally responsible for the debts of the business, no such requirement exists in an LLC, which is why most partnerships choose to become multi-member LLCs. The second big advantage is that the LLC can choose its federal tax treatment. An LLC can choose to be taxed as a partnership, a corporation, or as a sole proprietorship. By default, an LLC with more than one member is taxed as a partnership, and single-member LLCs are taxed as sole proprietorships. Now, many people are choosing LLCs because of other issues. For instance, LLCs are not subject to restrictions on the number and types of shareholders or the one class of stock limitations that are imposed on S-corporations. Another characteristic is the flexibility to allocate income loss on a basis other than each member's percentage interest in the LLC like the partnership rules do. In an S-corporation, allocations are based strictly on the basis of how much stock is owned. Most states tax LLCs the same way they are taxed under federal law, which means pass-through treatment is allowed and corporate entity level income taxes can be avoided. However, some states may impose other taxes such as franchise taxes, business occupation taxes, or other registration fees. Some states restrict which type of business is allowed to form an LLC. For example, California doesn't allow financial institutions, insurance companies, or trust companies to operate as LLCs. Arizona and Delaware and a few other states prohibit banks and insurance companies. A few states prohibit lawyers and law firms. Although these restrictions are becoming rarer, it's something that has to be checked for. While the last thing most small business people want to worry about is how their business is set up, it can have a tremendous impact on your future profitability. The time the prospective business person takes to study and decide on the proper business entity for their situation will pay off many times over. It can minimize expenses, including taxes. It can prevent penalties and fees for improperly running your business. It can protect the owners from liabilities that could not only destroy their business, but their personal assets as well. Now, while this may have seemed like a lot, I've really only given you a glimpse of the things that you need to take into consideration in setting up and operating a business. For those of you who are really serious about learning legal and tax structures, I do offer an advanced course a couple times a year, which includes transcripts and a complete support system to help you get it right. I'll give you a link to it in the description below. Should you be watching this video in between enrollment periods, you'll be given the chance to put your name on the list to be notified the next time it's available. In the next video of the series, we will get into the paperwork requirements of a small business you probably didn't even know about. So be sure to hit the subscribe button and notification so you don't miss the rest of this business training. And if you know of any other small business people who could benefit from this knowledge, please consider sharing it. And leave any comments about subjects you wish to learn more about or clarifications on what we've already discussed. I read them all.